Hello, I'm Wayne Thibodeau. We're sitting down one-on-one -on -one with Prince Edward Island Premier Robert Giz for our annual year-end interview. But this is a segment you will only see online here at The Guardian. For the full interview, check your local listings. We'll be on Eastlink TV and the full interview will be carried in The Guardian over the holidays. And Premier Giz, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Wayne. Let's start with the Provincial Museum. I remember early on your government promised one, it wanted one, it talked about one for a long time, but as you leave public office, you haven't delivered one. Why? The times weren't right. Uh, plain and simple is that, uh, you know, we got in, we did an analysis of a pro provincial museum, and I think our first estimate came back that it was going to be uh, a $50 million uh, build. Um, so unfortunately, um, that was not something that uh, we had the dollars. And when we were first elected in 2007, uh, you know, the federal government was increasing their transfers uh, percentage-wise. Uh, going forward, uh, the worldwide economy was booming, and then 2008, uh, you get hit with a, a worldwide recession. Uh, not the time to be building uh, museums, uh, and if you did, uh, uh, you know, you're kind of criticizing me for not building one, <laughs> but if we had a built one during those times we'd and spent that, that kind of money, we'd be talking about the criticism for building uh, the Provincial Museum. So true. Uh, it just wasn't the right time for it. Um, having said that, I still think it's a good idea. Uh, and that uh, as we get close to 2017, we have a federal government that's going to be cooperative in terms of uh, legacy projects. I think that would be a good one. In fact, it was in your throne speech too, so it's not off the table for sure. No, I think, I, I think you know, it's hard to find people that disagree building a provincial museum uh, is, is a bad idea, but we need to do it the right way. I mm. also want to talk about fixed election dates. It's an issue not only at Prince Edward Island, but across Canada. In our interview this time last year, you suggested, or you were talking about an April 2016 provincial election campaign. We're now talking about the potential of going to the polls early in the new year. The federal government's uh, fixed election date has been talked about, moved around back again. Is it practical for us to have fixed election dates with the political system that we have in place? No. Um, I brought in fixed election dates. Uh, at the time when you're in opposition, you need to promise something to make it look like you're uh, uh, being responsible. Uh, but after being premier, uh, if somebody asked me today a mistake, I would probably say fixed election dates were a mistake. I don't think they're a good idea. Um, but um, I was going to stick to ours uh, because I think that if you do have a fixed election date, you should, you should stick to it um, unless there's changes in your party. Um, and obviously, uh, a leader without a seat and a new leader of the other party, potentially without their seat, that's a good reason to have uh, a general election. And uh, probably in hindsight, we should have put that in the legislation, um, but we didn't. We actually put things in the legislation that if an MLA steps down, when you need to call a, a, a by-election by, but we didn't really factor it in that a premier steps down mm -hmm. uh, to put in when a general election has to be called by. Because, you know, let's say a, a premier steps down one year in, do you want someone there for three years uh, that, uh, uh, you know, doesn't have a mandate from the people. Uh, you know, that's uh, something that I think in a parliamentary democracy, there should be certain reasons why you should have um, uh, elections uh, and a leadership change uh, is, is one of those. So uh, the other thing too is with fixed election dates, uh, where I see there being a problem is everyone know when, when's the election going to be. So everyone who wants anything from government lines up all at the same time um, and I don't think it leads to good public policy. Uh, you know, I think that having the element of surprise to being able to call elections is good. So if I had to look back and said something that uh, I changed, uh, probably be fixed election date legis legislation. So I know it's not your problem, but would you recommend amending it or scrapping it? Uh, well, if you believe in fixed election dates, uh, I would uh, amend it um, and, uh, and, and to factor in different nuances that could happen, such as a premier stepping down um, or a change in leadership uh, or something like that. Uh, but that's just my personal opinion. You know, there, there's other jurisdictions, uh, elections that have worked and, you know, that for a time there was people saying, well, it's going to be bad for the government because you're giving too much opportunity for the opposition. Well, a lot of governments have got to re-elected under fixed election dates. Mm. Uh, you look in British Columbia, in Ontario, uh, us here in Newfoundland and Labrador, I think in Manitoba as well, um, but um, you know, I in hindsight now, if, if you had asked me something that uh, I don't think works well, personal opinion only, I don't want to put anybody 
uh, on the spot. That's not coming as the premier or liberal leader. Robert gives his personal opinion is uh, I'm not the biggest fan of fixed election dates. All right. I want to talk about elections, and that's the first election when you walked into the Premier's office. What surprised you most when you first walked into the, first, the fifth floor sorry, of the Shaw Building in Charlottetown? Uh, I'll say this. I wasn't overly surprised. Uh, I knew what to expect. Um, I had been in the office before. It's been mm -hmm. a while. Uh, but one of the coolest uh, and, uh, things that happened uh, was the first day when I come in and I address my cabinet. Um, and everyone had been sworn in, and I'd worked on notes on exactly here are the parameters and my expectations for being in cabinet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went in and I had a nice, probably 10 or 15 minute presentation to the cabinet on here's what I expect. And it was all handwritten notes. I didn't talk to any staff, it was just what I wanted to do. And someone came to me probably within a week or two and said, oh, we found this in the archives. Uh, these are the personal notes that your father had written uh, on his first cabinet meeting. Uh, and if you looked at the messages of both, they were almost identical. Uh, right. And I found that pretty uh, amazing that uh, both of us in our own handwriting uh, would deliver the exact same message with the exact same expectations uh, to our cabinet. Now, unfortunately, I think they got lost. Uh, but I'm hoping that when I leave, they, they uh, pop up again uh, somewhere uh, in the archives that someone saved and just uh, made a mistake on, on where they were uh, put. But uh, that was uh, I th a cool thing that happened mm. uh, on my first day. Whose notes did you use? Yours, yours or your dad's? I, I used mine, but they were, uh, you know, it, it kind of, because, uh, you know, I'm 33, I'm coming in, and mm -hmm. obviously I, I had a lot of respect for my father. And just to be able to see that we were both thinking the exact same way uh, when on our first day being Premier was, uh, was pretty special. Literally on the same page? Yeah. Well, Premier Giz, we had a chance to do this for the past eight years. Uh, it's been an honour. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Wayne. It's, Appreciate been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's just a small piece of our year-end interview with Premier Robert Giz. As I said, to catch the full interview, check your local listings. We're on Eastlink TV and we'll be in The Guardian over the holidays. Thanks for watching.